talking about strategies, strategies for struggling writers. And um, you feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Some of you have been doing that and you can also use the chat to ask questions. Um, Susan will be speaking for about 45 minutes to an hour. And after that, we will um, ask Q&A from the chat, but feel free to ask as we go and we'll note them for later. And we are recording the session so that we can screen it later. So um, welcome everyone. If you're not familiar with Real, we are Resilience and Engagement for Every Learner. I'm one of the co-founders, Yael Volek, and Callie Turk is the other co-founder here with me. The mission of Real is to ensure that twice exceptional students thrive in school by raising parent and educator awareness and understanding through resources, tools, events like this one, and services. So on our website, real2e.org, we have a lot of articles, blog posts, um, and recordings of past events from everything from how to uh, teach your child to self-advocate, um, how should strength-based learning work, what are some strategies for anxious 2E kids, and more. And also, you can share the 2E fact sheet with your teachers. Um, we have a couple of upcoming events and more going to be announced soon. Um, we have a support group with Parents Helping Parents on January 13th at 7 p.m. You can sign up on our website. And we will also have a strength-based parenting uh, event uh, in February. The date will be announced soon. And we have all of our other fall events recorded on our website. So feel free to browse those, including we just wrapped up the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit and we had three panels on K through 12. Um, if you'd like to keep in touch with us and you haven't yet, please join our real Google group where parents ask each other questions and we notify you of upcoming events or other interesting resources we come across um, our website and you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Real also hosts events uh, for educators. Uh, you can bring these workshops to your school, your district. Um, so please contact us if you would like us uh, to come and deliver these to your school. We have done these with several local school districts, including Intro to the 2E Learner, where we give interactive vignettes so people can go through actual stories of real 2E learners and what strategies help them in the classroom um, and learning difference simulations where we help, help, help build empathy um, for learning differences. So please contact us at real2e.org uh, to bring these workshops to your school. Kelly, I'm going to stop sharing so you can introduce Susan. Great. Well, I just couldn't be happier tonight and more excited to welcome Dr. Susan Baum as our guest speaker on strategies for struggling writers. When we surveyed our real community earlier this year to see which topics might be most helpful for, for everyone, writing came up almost at the very tip top. It was, it was right tied with anxiety. And when I saw that and we made the commitment to doing a session on writing, I knew there was no better person to address this topic and help the parents and educators in our community than Dr. Baum. She is a literal rock star in the twice exceptional universe. I, when you see her and you see people meet her, she's just, everyone's so alive when they get the chance to, to meet her. And she currently serves as the director of the TUI Center for Research and Professional Development at Bridges Academy and is the provost for academics at the Bridges Graduate School of Cognitive Diversity and Education. But those titles don't really reveal her deep commitment to creating new generations of leaders who can continue to find ways to support 2E and cognitively diverse students for many years to come. And I knew that she would be the best person to invite to speak because not only is she someone I've admired for many years, I also have the honor of um, having her as my advisor at the Bridges Graduate School in my doctoral program. And I have been so honored to be able to be in her classes when she talks about strategies for helping 2E kids, especially those that have writing challenges. The wisdom just flows and you want to soak up everything she says and, and only wish you could remember it all when you're actually sitting down to work with your child. So if only we could get Dr. Baum in front of every parent and teacher to talk about writing, I know that our students would both grow and enjoy their learning experiences in a much more authentic and deeply satisfying way. 
She has a long and distinguished career, and you can read her full bio on the website. Um, I'm not going to go into all those details. You can read all about her there, but I am so grateful she agreed to be with us here tonight, and I'm really looking forward to what she has to share and the question and answer session that will follow. Take it away, Dr. Baum. Well, it's great to be here, and I love to talk about this subject, uh, and it's one that troubles everybody. It's the product, it's productivity in general, specifically writing, that is particularly challenging. And why it's particularly challenging is because schools seem to be putting more and more emphasis on writing. Uh, school has become a secret language arts lesson, and that's not good for kids who can't write, because it's everything is about writing and uh, things that they might love to do in school, like go to science class to do experiments, they get bogged down because of all the writing that's required. So I'll, I'm going to share the screen and see if we can find this PowerPoint. Oh, I find, I, that's my biggest dilemma, I can never find them again. Uh, and I like to word it slightly differently. Um, Gifted, but won't produce strategies to ignite the reluctant writer. And it is really about motivation, uh, mostly, because writing, if it's difficult, will continue to be difficult. People who don't write well, it takes an awful lot of practice and an awful lot of grit and determination to just sit down and write, and even great writers get writer's block and can't always write. Writing is a challenging activity for these kids. If you would like this presentation, you can take a screenshot, I think, you can, of that tiny URL, and then you could have this presentation. I'll just wait a second. Okay. Um, let's talk about why writing is difficult for many, many children. And, and when writing is difficult for kids who are really, really bright, why is that? Well, writing is very complex. Note taking, for instance, is one of the most complex skills that there is in school. And Let's see how complicated it is. So in order to be able to write, take notes, initiate writing, sustain writing, kids have to dis activate and sustain attention during the sessions where they're brainstorming and beginning writing. They have to understand what's being asked of them. What is the writing prompt? What is it that the teacher is requiring? They need to have some knowledge about that topic. They need to figure out for whom is this writing? Who is the audience? They have to remember the rules, they have to remember grammar, how to have a topic sentence in a paragraph. They have to be able to organize the multitude of ideas in a linear way. They need to be able to use visual imagery. They need to be able to pull that specific word out when they need it. Their writing should set a tone. If they're not automatic in spelling and handwriting, it can become a complete disaster. Writing is a complex task that requires much organization, executive function, and uh, knowledge. For our kids, learning breaks down in specific areas that makes it very difficult for them to write. For instance, when we use this information processing model for, to talk about how these kids learn, it gives us a, a way to understand better what's happening when they sit there staring at the paper. So in order for learning to happen, the, 
the environmental stimuli has to be positive, pleasant, and something that the kids are, are tuning into. So if the child is daydreaming and the teacher is talking in a monotone voice, the child will just continue to daydream because the inner world is much more exciting than whatever the teacher is saying. But not only that, I mean, we know some of our kids are better as auditory learners, some of them are better visual, some of them, you know, need to be moving around in order to pay attention. They're attracted to pictures, music, there's different stimuli in the environment that is either accepted by their brains or repelled. And one of the reasons it gets repelled is because of the amygdala. Any piece of information that enters the brain immediately passes through the amygdala. That is our fight or flight. So if kids have had a bad experience with writing, that amygdala is going to say, don't do it, avoid it, shut down, flee, fight. It's protecting them from negative experiences. And so it might just be that they just go into that stress, automatic stress responses, fight, flight, freeze. Um, every writing experience that's negative will make the connection that between fear and negativity will we get reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. So a history of not writing just means that writing is going to be more and more difficult to happen spontaneously and joyously if we don't do some intervention. Once the information gets into the brain, it does it through the working memory, which is very short, very quick, and that working memory takes the information and sends it off to long-term memory. And many of our children who are 2E have difficulty with working memory. That does not work well for them. The working memory it's involved when we are inputting information, inputting the directions. If there are too many directions at once, that, that working memory cannot hold on to all of them, so it forgets some of them. That working memory is supposed to be able to see if something's important, not important, and it happens instantaneously. So if, in fact, the information that comes in is not rejected by the amygdala, and the working memory does send it off into long-term memory, it gets stored somewhere. And depending on the kind of brain our kids have, if these are kids with autism, often it gets filed on their desktop. If they're ADHD, it gets in a file folder, but the details somehow get lost. So. The children's brain wiring is, is going to dictate how they store information and which will make it either easier for them to retrieve or more difficult. Because when we ask them to write about how they spent their summer, they need to figure out where is all the information about the summer? What are all the things I did? And some of them will remember it in pictures. Some of it will say, I'd rather not remember it all and have repressed it. Some of them <clears throat> remember that they did so much and it was so much fun going to that theater camp. And it, the memories just come flooding back at such rapid pace that the working memory cannot handle it, cannot take that and and organize it so the child can get it out in some sort of linear fashion. And then worse than that, if they do get it out and the teacher says this is to be in writing, especially handwriting, everything can break down again. And the more anxious the child is about writing, the worse the brain functions. 
So whereas the working memory may be adequate, if the child is anxious, the working memory then becomes more problematic. Processing speed, how quickly they can all do this and think about getting information in, information out so that they can write is slowed down. That whole, um, because anxiety is interfering. Let me give you an example of what we mean with this working memory and when you have too much information. I want you to count the squares. Everybody count them. And put in the chat how many you see. Right now, don't wait, do it. <laughs> Callie, can you read any to me? We're getting a lot of 16s, 24, 27, 17, 29, 21. Yeah. You're adults and you can't count and you wonder why your kids can't write? 26, yeah, 27. Why is this difficult? Okay. 42. <laughs> okay, stop, stop. Why, why is this difficult? Is because our brain or the working memory, your spatial memory has a lot to hold on to. If we say 16, it's because we are only seeing the obvious, those squares that are one by ones. But there are squares that are two by twos, and there are squares that are three by threes, and there are squares that are four by fours. And your brain, your working memory, has to hold them in their brain while you try to count them. The more information that the brain has to process, the more difficult the job is for that working memory and for our kids who are so gifted and have a lot of information stored in their brain because they know a lot about anything, asking them to pull it out and organize it when there's so much up there is really, really difficult. And what they need to get it out is something we call scaffolding. So let me show you how scaffolding works. Once I gave you information how that might help you organize and see it differently. Ah, there are two by twos, now I can see them and I need to count the three by threes. Just with that little hint, some of you are gonna be able to count those squares better. If I give you another little hint, I'll say, what are the easy ones to count? Well, one by ones, they were easy, 16. And the four by fours, that was easy. So all of a sudden now, you're being able to organize the information. And some of you, some of you are going to say, wait a minute, isn't that interesting? There are 16 one by ones and one four by four. If I multiply one times one, the answer is one. And if I multiply four times four, the answer is 16. So some of you are thinking that may, you may have a clue how to fill in the numbers for the next one. And you might say, well, if two times two is four, maybe that's how many three by threes there are. And what do you know? How many two by twos? And some of you are saying, wait a minute, these are all perfect squares. Scaffolding is giving little hints and adding hints if they, the kids need more. And when our kids are writing and trying to get ideas out of their long-term memory, through that working memory, they need this kind of scaffolding. Sometimes we call it webbing. Sometimes we call it outlining. Sometimes we call it making a flow chart. It becomes very important that there is some sort of scaffolding that get, helps that working memory organize the information. But as I said before, anxiety is going to be the worst enemy for our kids. Those early experiences with writing, criticism about writing, 
teachers saying and, and schools and standards saying we need 10 writing pieces a marking period are killers. And it's almost cruelty. And the pencil, throw out the pencil. 95% of these kids shouldn't have to do handwriting. And you can quote me. <laughs> if handwriting isn't automatic, it slows things down even more. And because of our kids, it isn't just the handwriting. The brighter they are, it's more about that working memory and processing and getting the ideas organized than it is only about the handwriting. And why would we bother when we have so much technology where kids can avoid the pencil? As a matter of fact, just, I have these kids using technology, we'll talk about it again and again, as young as they can, because as they get older, handwriting will become easier. But our kids who are so asynchronous, handwriting doesn't work well when they're five, six, seven years old. Because our kids have a lot of unevenness between their social and emotional development, their psychomotor development, and their cognitive development. They're juggling them all the time. Their cognitive age might be 12 years old. Their psychomotor age might be their chronological age, maybe they're six, or maybe even lower, maybe a four. And their social and emotional age is usually, again, it could also be much lower than their cognitive age and sometimes even lower than their chronological age. That's why they have meltdowns and temper tantrums. Their wonderful ideas that they have in their head to build with Legos, to write a story, to get these great ideas out, and when they can't do it the way they envision it, that perfectionism may also kick in. It is too much for them to deal with. And what happens? They have a meltdown or a temper tantrum and act like they're two. So given that we're talking about anxiety and that kids have trouble with working memory and they're going to need some sort of scaffolding what are some things that you can focus on things to try and i'm going to put them into five categories and these could work in school they can work at home and let's you know take a closer look the first idea is that we should do away with the word writing I tell teachers, don't have a writing corner, have an author's corner. How many different ways are there to get our ideas out? These kids hear the word writing and they are go the amygdala is going to have them shut down. But there are so many different things you can do to author. Um, and authoring is creative expression. Kids can do podcasts. Kids can do storyboards. Kids could make films. Kids can write poetry. Kids can do email notes to each other. Kids could give a monologue. That's authoring. How about a photographic essay? And so when teachers say, I need to have a story, or I need to have your ideas out, I think the first thing we need to say is, and what different, and do I have a choice in how I want to get my ideas out? You're saying, but how are they going to get better at writing? If you don't make them excited about, confident in getting their ideas out, You'll never get them to write. They've got to enjoy communicating. They've got to enjoy letting the world know what their thoughts are. They've got to feel confident about that. And once that happens, putting them ideas on paper is much, much easier. 
Here in the classroom, they had a storytelling interest center instead of a writing center. And there were all kinds of things in that center. And the kids were going to do storytelling. They could tell another story or they could make up their story. But do you know how storytellers tell a story? Let's see if it's in here. Uh, they do it by making a storyboard first. They like a filmmaker. And if kids are very spatial and they think in pictures, the best way to start is visually. And I know that I did a study once, I was in a second grade classroom, and we had some kids draw the picture before they wrote the story. We had all the kids draw the picture before they write those, wrote the story one day, and the other day we had them write the story first and then draw. Well, as you can imagine, half the class did better when they drew the picture, but then they wrote the story. The other half of the class needed to write the story first before they drew the picture because we have cognitive diversity, because our brains are wired differently. So any time we think there's one way for our kids to write, and here are the steps, brainstorm your ideas and put them down on paper. Well, that's good for some kids. Any time there's one heuristic, throw it away. It's not appropriate. You've got to understand how that mind works to have appropriate pre-writing. A fun thing to do that kids can have success in all the time is getting a page from a book and say, you know what, in this book we're going to end up with a poem and it's got to be about something like maybe anger or fun. Or maybe it's going to be um, something about summer vacation. And they go and circle the phrases on that page that remind them of whatever the theme is. And then they kind of blot out the rest. And before you know it, the, all those words you circle becomes a beautiful found poem. It is amazing to do. And it would be fun as a family to do this. Let's all do found poetry. You can go online and find a lot of examples of it. They can decorate it. It'd be so much fun where we as a family are having fun creating poems and never, ever writing at all. So here's one. This was take note of simple things, goodness within mundane. Life is happening. Hustle in the sun tucks high in the trees. Today, take note, despite everything. Isn't that fun? How fun is that? Um, so, strategy one was, let's think about other products about communication that isn't about writing. Strategy number two is to pay attention to the pre-writing activity. What are the children going to do before they write? And we have somebody sitting in this audience who did a study on this, and she can tell you more about it later. <laughs> and it's not me who did the study. Um, What if you have a Lego, Lego builder at home? And when they build something, and they might build a pirate ship, or they may build a rocket ship, or they may build a land that's where aliens live, it's amazing what story they could tell you about who is on that pirate ship, their personality as a character, what, where that ship is going, where it's been, what the problem is. This is their pre-writing. Build it and they will then find the words. I say to kids, if I want to know the setting of the story, go build it for me. I say to high school kids, let's look at Macbeth. Let's look at Act One. I want you to look at each of the scenes and I want you to build the setting for each of the scenes. 
Wow. And they have to underline the words that led them to believe that that's what that setting should look like. And maybe it's not building. Maybe these you have a young artist or a cartoonist and you be, before they sit down to write anything, they you do a little visualization with them. Or maybe they're actors and they have to write a story and they have no idea whatsoever. So you let them act it out. Let's pretend you're this character. You, and we could play this as a family, my own family, we play this all the time. Every time there's a family holiday, we have something to act out, to do improv about, and the, and the you know we just pick this out of the hat, and and we do the improv. It is the funniest thing. We have so much fun. I can't even tell you. One day we were laughing so hard. I don't even want to tell you what happened as a result of that. But so they they pull us out. You're Don the lazy dragon slayer. It was so funny. We were working with a bunch of high school kids, and one of these kids who never talked, never talked at all, and actually had a lot of emotional issues because he was depressed. And he never talked. And he picks up that card, and all of a sudden he starts talking in a brogue. That was unbelievable. Don was, had this story, this dragon slayer had a story that was unbelievable. And don't you know it? That once you can say it, you can write it. And would I use handwriting? No. If they're really reluctant to use handwriting, maybe we would do voice to text during that improv. And once it's in the computer, once it's on paper, then they can fix it. And sometimes I'll scaffold the game. So if you're going to interview those people, Don the Dragon Slayer, what do you want to ask them? Who's in their family? What their hobbies are? And you can brainstorm all kinds of things so that the interview is rich and the character gives you a lot to say so you could even write about the character you met that day. And there's one of the kids we were working with, the character interviews. When I use storyboarding, I have them draw the paper into six frames. And the first frame is the setting. The second frame talks more about the, this particular main character of the story. And so before they put a picture in that box, we do some character interviews about that character. The next two are what the problems happen in this story. Next frame, how do we fix the problem? And then the conclusion. Here are two kids with severe learning disabilities. And we had a whole bunch of these kids together and we said, how many of you like to write? Nobody raised their hand. There were 27 kids in this classroom. Instead, we let them be partners. And that day, they were going to rewrite the story of Humpty Dumpty. And we brainstormed, you know, who is Humpty Dumpty? You know, who is he? Because in the nursery rhyme, it doesn't say he's an egg, and he doesn't say that um, it's a boy or a girl. Humpty can be anywhere, anything you want. And where's the wall? And what kind of a wall is it? And so some of them decide they're sitting in, in Fenway Stadium in Boston. Humpty is sitting on the edge of the wall, that green wall where lots of home runs are hit. What a story came out. And as we developed, learned more about this character sitting on the wall during that character interview, we felt that his, we found out that his wish was to catch a, a ball, a home run that was hit by his favorite player on and on. And then, so when the kids get all their pictures done, they tell the story before the writing. This was a long time ago. This was a picture when they were talking about, um, they were looking for, uh, um, what are they looking for? Saddam Hussein, I think. And they felt that, the, that Saddam Hussein was, the, was Humpty in prison, sitting on a prison wall. And it became very metaphorical, and they told this very rich story. 
And then the writing, each day we would write about one frame, one frame. The other thing we need to think about when we're talking about writing is that sometimes the pre-writing has to be when kids are moving. Often we, in school, I see too often that I'm kids... I'm not sure I understand. Uh, I see teachers trying to be supportive of kids, especially those with ADHD, and they think the child would focus better if there were fewer distractions. And on the IEP, it will say, put the desk, put their desk near the front of the room, near the teacher's desk, so they're not distracted. This is meant to help the child, but it can have an adverse effect. Kids with ADHD need to walk around to get their ideas. They need to talk out their ideas. They need to have someone to spin their ideas off with good feedback, good criticism. So sometimes what I do, I pick a talking partner, the walking talking partner, and the kids walk around the room, even at home. When you want your child to talk to you, take them out for a walk. Don't look at them in the eye and never say, look me in the eye. You want to shut them down completely? <laughs> Don't do it. If I need you to be social and it's important to look them in the eye, that's something very different. But when I'm trying to talk to you about my ideas and I need to concentrate walking and looking straight ahead or sitting in the back seat of the car and talking with you in the front seat driving, Movement energizes the brain. Lots of wonderful ideas come forward. These are pre-writing ideas. Let's talk about more scaffolding then. What can we do if we, after pre-writing and the child is sitting there with no ideas, none? Well, there are very interesting kinds of things you can do. This is called the morphological matrix. It is a creativity strategy. They use it in business. They use it in think tanks. And they used it to develop the plots for the Lone Ranger series, if you're old enough to remember the Lone Ranger. And so the writing team got together and they had these four columns. Who could the hero be in this episode? There's always a villain. Who could the villain be? What could the setting be? Where is this? And what is the situation that we want to talk about? And then they just put different together. Lone Ranger is going to be the hero, but, and he's going to try to capture someone who's escaped. And it's taking place in a gold mining town. And he was in jail from stealing horses. These things you put together randomly. Sometimes I have the kids just roll a dice and with lots of ideas, and this would be the Big Bang Theory, we can say that, you know, or, or their last four digits of their phone number. And mine is 7979. So the hero would be number seven. The four would be the ninth one. The problem is number seven, and the solution would be the ninth one. Or they pick the ones they want. But it gets them started. It gives them a scaffold to begin to get ideas. And then they write. To start off, they write a pitch for the show. So they're just giving you a little summary of where this story is going. And that is a wonderful way to scaffold the idea. Um, let's talk about technology because of all the ideas, this is probably one of the best gifts we have to get kids to be productive. I'm going to just play you a, a clip from a teacher at Bridges. Uh, I'm going to move it up a little bit because I... Okay. In writing. Um very lucky i've had some students that are just incredibly mentally present and full of understandings but just chose to not share any of that with me for maybe six months let's open up um and go to the group doc add any of your ideas about um 
what we were work what we read about today and take a read through what your peers added this morning and obviously add all of your own discussion ideas and questions to it we consider the idea of everyone sharing one document by everyone i mean like six people in one room and the, the funny thing about this they all said oh this will never work uh, we will ruin this somebody's going to like control a and delete everything somebody's going to just mess with it they all said this and they didn't do that we really should have like one unified language by now i mean like they tried to do that with esperanto you know that right also that wouldn't climate affect like dialect wouldn't climate and topography of an area affect a dialect of a certain language they started posing questions to each other they started leaving questions there that they felt that other people could answer and other people started answering them i had a student that very early in the year like i had his parents coming in saying you can't make our son write he's got dyslexia and he's got dysgraphia um and he's just not going to do it today he wrote he wrote the most out of anyone in the group and actually went on to start wrote well over half a page of just notes about morality and apes and then uh, began editing other people's gramming, grammar and spelling because he could a lot of the time if you don't let them know they're on a tightrope they forget they're up pretty high A uh, uh, joint, couldn't you see doing this at home that you're going to write, write questions to each other and that you keep that Google Doc open and have people just keep commenting on it and asking questions. And it's just uh, when we want to support kids and you can kind of, if, it's, if your child is writing a Google Doc and he's in his room and you see he's stuck, you could sit down and type some words to get him started again. At Bridges, we do that. Sometimes kids want to be in a writing cave and they don't want anyone watching them. But the teacher can watch what they're doing and see where they get stuck and come in just at that point and say, try this word or, or finish the phrase for them and keep them going again. Another thing we really want to do, again, is use those speech to text programs. There's in Google Docs has something called voice typing. Look, the, Siri does it for us all the time when we're texting. There's no reason kids can't dictate their first draft of ideas onto paper and then they can fix them and then they can organize them. They've got to get them out of, their, out of their head. There are programs you can buy, Kidspiration and Inspiration, where these programs, the kids can be brainstorming a web and the program will turn that web into an outline or into a flow chart and all the, they can get a lot of ideas out and depending on what that scaffold is that allows them to move forward inspiration can do that for those for the kids but what i really really like is getting kids motivated by technology. There's a program called Animoto. This was a wonderful project that one child did on Native Americans. They don't have it available anymore. I can't, I can't get it. But they did their report. You, put, you create images, you do your research, you find the pictures you want to use to tell the story. You make the storyboard with images, move them around. Then you put the music in you might want in the background. Then you type in the text. I had uh, one of our doctoral students' son was really in high school and was doing nothing and really upset. And she heard me talking about Animoto in class one day. And she went to her son and showed him the program. He happens to also be a musician. He wrote his own music. He created this most wonderful report on whatever the topic was and this beautiful multimedia project and there was text but the music and the images made there there was no need to have maximum text because we didn't need quite as many words uh, in animoto there's an idea to how to have a book report 
instead of writing the book report, and I'm gonna see if I can do this. If I have trouble, you can look on your own. So let me see if I can get there. I have to stop sharing for a minute. And I have to share again. I think it's this one. Um, yeah. Can we see it, Callie? Yeah, I can't see it. You might not be able to see it. We can see it. Looks. It, I think we can see right. it. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Okay, go back to the <laughs> stop sharing, new share. PowerPoint. Wouldn't the kids have much more fun if they could do their book report by using Animoto and making a little video? And they wrote, they, it, it, there's something very tempting and seductive about writing when you're doing it to form media than sitting there and writing a paragraph on a piece of paper. A Glockster is another great thing to do for a report. They, this is online, they take the, the this is a, a poster all about armor in the Middle Ages. And in Glockster posters, you can put video clips, you write up your, some of your own stuff, you find quotes that you wanna use. These are ways that kids can get their ideas on paper and they're authoring and they're writing. We need to expand our definition of things being in writing. My daughter-in-law taught fifth grade and instead of having the kids write spelling words, she allowed them to use Vokey. These are creating speaking avatars. And so whatever the spelling words were for that week, the two characters that the kids created, they needed to have them have a conversation and use those words. Do you remember writing them five times each? The kids loved doing these. Again, there's so many ways to inspire kids in terms of using technology. The last idea I want to talk about is sometimes our most reluctant writers will write if there's a reason to write, an authentic reason, something they want badly. Um, they need to be emotionally engaged. And when they write with a purpose, they stay in the struggle. If they wanted to write a letter to the principal because they wanted to change the dress code and they wanted that principal to take them seriously, they wouldn't mind editing. They'd want the words spelled correctly. They would want there to be a good persuasive argument. It's the teachable moment. If the, your kids or you're talking about something that your family's upset about and you talk about writing letters to the editor, wow. If you, the family, decides to do that, what a great authentic purpose for that child to write. During that time, they're more receptive to feedback. They become more confident as writers because it has a real world application. So at Bridges Academy, our high school kids are allowed to be in the robotics first. These are our engineers. They don't like to write. As a matter of fact, I do some work with the School of Engineering at the University of Connecticut, and I talked to a lot of engineers, and I was telling them that a lot of the two-week kids don't write. So the engineer says to me, do you think we like to write? We hate writing. <laughs> it goes with the brain. But in Robotics First competition, the kids have to write a business plan. 
And so they, and they have a deadline. And if they don't submit the business plan, their entry will not be counted. They're pretty motivated to write, they write. Here's a little character, a boy who never likes to write. This is when he was in our elementary school and we have chickens at Bridges Academy. And he was the head of the chicken club. And he wanted to, con he, and he came to um, the, the head, the, the teacher who was in charge of the chicken club said, look, we want to have more chickens. So the teacher said, you better write a business plan then to give it to Carl, our head of school, and maybe he'll let you have more chickens. He hates to write, but he wrote. To whom it may concern, the chicken club has showed quite a bit of success for this past year. The program is therapeutic for students. Students have learned about life cycles, composting, animal behavior, and so much more. They have problem solved on creating shelter and protection. All students have practiced calculations on how much supplies to order and cost. So all of these items above show how we've been such a success in the last year. On another note, we are now making $15 a week, which adds up to $60 a month from our three laying chickens, laying six to seven eggs each week. So we did some calculations that if we could get two more chickens at $35 each, we could make 30 to $45 a week. This would lower our out-of-pocket costs and save up for their retirement. <laughs> to whom it may concern. And so, again, if the child is invested in the results of the writing, they're much more willing to do it. And I can tell you story after story. I find that the more, I mean, maybe your child's an actor and they take a screenwriting class. They're gonna write in that screenwriting class. They may never write in the English class. They, you know, that investment's important. The last thing I wanted to talk about in the relevant, uh, you know, is these school-based opportunities. And uh, I have a friend who is a principal who really wanted kids to write, and he did everything he could to get them motivated to write. And one of the things that they did was uh, they had something called the Magic Mailbox, and kids could submit writing every week. And they had a team of student editors, and they would look at the writing and decide whether that writing should be pub be chosen for the writing of the week, be sent to a contest, uh, be illustrated by the uh, the enrichment cluster that did illustrations. Where could it go? Well, one place it could go was it could be you, the child, if that child's piece of writing were chosen to be put to music, where the child works with the music teacher and they create a, you know, music, they write music and that child sings their piece that gets recorded on the CD that the school puts out every year, Songs of Walcott Elementary School. And so this is my absolute favorite. This was done by a second grader who didn't like to write, but she did like to talk about her grandma. Summer and in the snow, she takes me shy. 
She wrote a little poem and the music teacher said, go home and sing it to me. Go home and keep singing it. And finally when you, you know, and she practiced it and then she, the music teacher showed her how to transcribe it. But your, our kids make up songs all the time. They're always singing. And there's a, maybe we should just record it. And their lyrics just come. Writing doesn't have to be anxiety producing. It can happen naturally. And everyone wants to write things down and so we don't lose them. And if we can support our kids in finding their favorite way to get their ideas on paper or shared in some way, we are taking a big step forward. And we can go from, I won't do it, I can't do it. I want to do it. How do I do it? I'll try to do it. I can do it. I will do it. Yes, I did. Writing is a, de it's a developmental growth process. You need to walk before you can run. And thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Baum. This is amazing. So many good ideas and rich things that we can all take away. And I want to encourage anyone who has a question to enter it in the chat. Um, I also want to introduce everyone to um, Abby Kerrigan, who is the newest member of our real team, who is going to be helping us go through all of uh, the Q&A as well and making sure we're asking questions both that have been asked in the chat tonight and also that came in. Um, as part of the RSVP process. And Susan, I was just wondering if you could, before we jump into questions, tell me again the URL for the slides because some people were able to get it and some were not, and I just want to make sure I have it right. Uh, let me look at it. Hold on, let me just quickly look at it. Yeah, El says she was able to get in, so yeah, El, maybe you can well, post. I, it's a tiny URL, so it's HTTPS. Well, you want to see it? Sure. All right. Uh... And um, we're also hearing it's read only that they can't download the file. Right. But is that that how you intended it? Was just so people could get to it, but not necessarily save it. Uh, yeah, I just. Um, That's yeah. fine. Um, all right. Well, I. That is that is the link I put in the chat. I don't know why it is working for some people and not for others, but we will make sure to to work on that um, before we send out the recording to everyone and just make sure we can get get those that information out. Uh, Abby, do you want to kick us off with questions that have come sure. in from the group? Yes. Um, yeah, I'll go. I'll go ahead. Um, the first one. Susan, hi, how are you? Hi, good. Um, nice to see you. <laughs> um, is uh, someone asked, uh, doesn't every job require you to write at some point? And I think just my own two cents on this, and I think you kind of covered a lot of this during the talk, but I think in classes I've had with you and others at Bridges, um, I think one of the things that's emphasized is that there are times when you're the student needs to learn to write, and then you're going to work on writing with them. But then there are times when 
the student needs to show mastery of a topic, and that's when you can provide those choice and options where they may not need to write in those cases to show that they mastered the content. Um, that's just my two cents on that. But if you want to add anything um, about, you know, don't our kids all have to learn to, to write because doesn't every job require you to write at some point? Take it away. Well, all those technology things and voice to text is the way you start writing. I mean, there's so many ways to scaffold writing with inspiration and, and all those writing programs. I don't think I said they'll never have to write and we don't write. And look at the teacher at Bridges. The kids were learning to write on that video and we build from there one step at a time. We gotta get them, give them a way that they can get their ideas on paper in a way that is manageable for them. So I'm sorry if anyone thought I said they never have to write in their lives. You know, but again, uh, the more they are confident and they have something important to say, and, they, and they'll always, if Siri can do it for them, why not? What is the difference? Remember your boss, in the olden days when you were a secretary, the boss used a dictating machine. And that's how they wrote and they had their secretary type it from that dictating machine. Nothing new. This isn't new stuff. All right, great. We also have a question about editing. Um, so in this case, they're talking about a 12-year-old boy who, who does enjoy writing, but doesn't enjoy you know, going back and editing, working on sentence structure, punctuation, and capitalization. And uh, the question was, what's the best way to get this child to go back and revise and edit? Well, first of all, it must be on te with technology. Handwriting and writing it all over again, I wouldn't do it either. So editing has to be that first draft ends up somehow in some sort of word processing program and then teaching them the fun, of the tools that they can use to edit. And um, everything shouldn't have to be edited. So the, if, the, if the teacher said, look, this is, has to really be edited because we're going to submit it to a, a, a journal or this is we're going to write an editorial to the newspaper. So if they could pick one or two things a month that it's really important to edit because there's an authentic audience, the children will get into the habit of editing. All right, great. Um, I'm gonna jump to another one that I uh, really like here, which was, does, does, do you have any ideas on how to approach a school or a teacher to motivate them to use some of these alternatives? Um, you know, easy research to point to or other ways you can, that, that you found that have uh, helped teachers sort of see the light on these topics? Um, I think that if you um, have a child do a project at home, like a book report like that, and then you showed it to the teacher, and, you know, how could you not like that kind of book report <laughs> and say, you know what, you know, and maybe the teacher doesn't know how to use that particular app. And if you could learn how to use it and say, I'd love to teach the kids in the class how to use that and maybe, you know, so that they could all use that. I think teachers today are between a rock and a hard place. They're being required to ask for more writing. And, you know, I'm glad I'm not in the classroom because I do think that the kids are burning out on writing. That's a, a real deep belief for me. And so, but if you say, you know what, if you can do this again, if we can have one fun thing, like the spelling words with Volkey, it's more about giving kids choice and teachers like to give kids choices and having, teaching kids these different programs, these different technology programs allows them to choose the way they would like to write that day. So Susan, related to that, we, we had a question that came in um, in the chat that's similar to a question that came in um, in our pre, you know, RSVP question list. And, and that's really about, you know, this, this is about how do we be agents of change for systems that have these very, very heavy writing requirements. And what can we do to help both public schools and some private schools um, like this person says, Davidson Academy, but how do we help get schools to really adopt the strategies that you're suggest suggesting? 
I think so, I, and I, what are effective ways for for parents to do that with teachers and to actually get teachers to listen or to get the system to listen to parents? I do think we need to talk about communication rather than just writing. So there will be maybe a time we're going to focus on writing this marking period. We're going to do all kinds of genre. And we're going to focus on writing and we'll scaffold it for the kids so they can be successful. But there's so many ways to communicate. So another a month, maybe we're going to focus on how to make an effective poster. You know, and I think that in the world of communication, social media, uh, how we communicate on TV, those, there's, we're not teaching them enough skills. They have to sell an idea. Public speaking is important. And so I do think if we can kind of convince them, what is your communications program rather than what's your writing program? And ask and bring in evidence how important that is going to be for them to be leaders, to be able to have skills more than in communication other than just writing. And I guess related to that, like how would your advice change as you're going through different grade levels? Because I think, you know, it, the, the person who wrote this in beforehand, and I think this is really true, is, you know, when, as your kids get into high school, you know, they run and they're going to run, you're going to run into people who only teach English and they love writing. And that's probably why they're teaching English in high school, right? Is because they loved writing and they believe in it so much. So, you know, they may or may not see themselves as a communications teacher or that, you know, so how do you kind of help bring them along? Are there well, little things you can do? Well, the standard the California standards, and we're talking about language arts, it's not just writing. It's speaking, listening, reading, and, you know, and writing. So that speaking anyway would be something that they should cover. It's a standard. They should be covering it. My son goes to a high school in the Santa Barbara area, and I was helping him with a project. He had a writing project to do, but it was, they had just read, um, a death of a salesman and they had to do a project and it had to be a presentation it wasn't writing the the book before it was a writing piece this book it was a, a presentation very clever presentation about what they were going to do with death of a salesman create i would ask to make sure my high school student had teachers who are a little bit more creative creative teachers don't like to sign the same thing all the time I like to give choices. So I think it's a matter of looking for the more creative teachers who are project oriented, who know that there are many genres of writing, uh, different genres are easier for our kids than others. Poetry is one that kids do well. Screenwriting is one that they do well. And so, you know, finding that type of teacher would make it much easier. <laughs> And I don't know if uh, Yael or Abby have one they want to ask, but just kind of since we're talking about ninth, talking about high school, I want to make sure we address that. You know, I think a lot of the things that you covered, they were so inspiring, and I could see how they were really great for fiction storytelling. You know, and and then I could see how like a lot of the authentic projects are really helpful at the high school level, right? Like write a proposal for your team. You know, write for funding for a project you have in mind. A lot of what kids are have to do as they're moving from high school to college is actually start to write personal narratives uh, again. Sometimes they had to do that in elementary school, and then they come to their college essays, and now they have to write about themselves again. And that's not something some of these kids are great at doing, right? Like reflecting on themselves and and responding to prompts that other people have come up with for them to respond to. So I wondered, like, in terms of that phase, like, are there specific strategies that maybe – you've recommended that could be applied in that situation? And, and how would you advise parents to kind of work with their, their high schoolers as they're starting to think about communicating about who they are and... Um, I have a friend, Tom Abair, whom I just saw at NAGC, and we were just talking about this. He did a wonderful session. He does a lot of work with social and emotional. And, and kids have to bring pictures, photographs, that they, for some reason, if I want to know about you. So they pick five photographs that best represent them. And they come in and they explain, you know, who they are based on the photographs they chose. It's that pre-writing that gets their brains going. You start with a photographic essay of something, of who I am, uh, and then develop each one of those 
And why did you pick this? And if you look at the pictures you pick, what does that say about me? You know, in, in terms of, you know, they're deep thinkers, they may be able to see a theme and be very inductive about it. It's one way to, to think about it. Uh, another way is it might be just talking about um, some, you know, memories, you know, that they've had, experiences that they've had that made uh, deep impressions on them. And so it's the right prompts, the right um, uh, even writing an essay why you don't want to reflect on yourself. We found this is very effective with our two week kids. Sometimes I want to write about why they don't think they should have to take the SATs and why it's unfair. Uh, that is a great thing to get them going when they begin to have an opinion about something and argue it. So it's really about themselves. That is a reflection piece, but it's one that seems to have a lot of emotional energy attached to it and they want to argue it. And so, um, that's another thing to think about those topics that they are angry that they have to do this. <laughs> um, there's another question here in the chat. Um, in your slide where learning breaks down, you start the processes which are challenging for different learners, like kids with slow processing speed. Do different processes become easier for these learners as their brains mature or will writing always be hard for them? they will have less trouble writing in an area where they have expertise. Everything will get better as they develop an area that they have a lot of knowledge about. You know, they, they, they are wonderful. I was, when I was looking up, I was annoyed that one of these links that I use all the time was no longer working. And I went to look for these technology project designers where they allow you to make little note cards of things. So when you get an idea, a lot of these kids get lots of ideas but they're all out of order. And you actually, in these uh, technology, these programs, and they're project organizers, they allow you to make little note cards and then you can move the note cards around. And then you can use those, and then those note cards then can become more of an outline. And I think these kids need to know what uh, tools will really be helpful to them in organizing big ideas, organizing their thoughts for a paper, uh, and it helps them visualize the idea and keep track of the idea. One of the things that helps these kids, and I didn't mention it, if they do the PowerPoint before they do the writing, they like to make PowerPoints. It's easier for them. They get sometimes get lost in the fonts and we can't let them use the fonts right away. But instead of telling them to write the paper first and then create the presentation, they're better off doing the presentation first. And that becomes an outline. And even if they want to put visuals, they just don't mind creating these PowerPoint shows. So use those as an advanced organizer. All right, um, I think jumping back a little bit to how do you see these changes in your classroom? Uh, one of the attendees commented that, you know, they, they talk to their school and the school says they'd love to give kids less work and more free time for exploration, but that the teachers and school gets backlash from the parents who are worried about the kids, you know, having enough training to succeed in middle school and then high school, et cetera. Um, and what are some strategies you can give us to convince other parents? That's a tough one because <laughs> as parents, you know, we don't want to leave, leave any stone unturned. We really want to make sure that our kids have every advantage that we can give them. But I think that um, one thing is you have to understand what's correct developmentally. What should the child be doing? A lot of, uh, I am, uh, my favorite thing is creativity. I teach graduate courses in it, not in my own graduate school, but in, <laughs> I just don't have time to teach that course. But it's, I wrote a book about creativity. Um, uh, the creative process starts with play. The most brilliant mathematicians play practical jokes on people, thinking of Richard Feynman. Play, a scientist played with molds for penicillin 
and that's how they discovered penicillin. There, the mind has to have something to write, has to have something to say. And the only way the child's going to have something to say if they experiment, if they take risks, if they try to do things their own way, if they wonder and ponder, I wonder what would happen if. So it doesn't, you need to allow that kind of thinking throughout one's development, throughout one's development. And, um, and, I don't, I think that if we begin to offer choice and the, then if a parent is bent on the child writing more, I mean, maybe there needs to be what we call enrichment clusters. We do that. Uh, it's a very popular enrichment strategy throughout the country where one, uh, three hours a week kids are in a group with another group of kids who like what they like and they create something. And some of them could be young writers and they write and write. Some of them are debaters and they're writing their arguments. There are some kids who are really good at writing. They should be writing. There are other kids who have a lot to say and they write and they're going to give a podcast. And even if you tell them they don't have to write it, they'll go over it and they will write it. It's the motivation, the purpose. And that's why a lot of them don't do well. And, you know, they don't like these essays in literature. I had one kid tell me on the spectrum, if I can write and write, if you ask me to write nonfiction, but this fiction stuff, I hate it. And you know what? So what? Don't do very much of it. You'll never have to do it in your life. I mean, let's be realistic. Um, maybe we have to write in our jobs, but some jobs don't have different kinds of writing. They don't, not everybody has to write a five paragraph essay. Usually no one has to write a five paragraph essay. And the truth is, I have a good friend at the University of Connecticut. They hired him to, when the freshmen came in to unteach them the five paragraph essay. That is not how people write. And it was his job to get the kids away from that type of writing. So, you know, uh, I think we just need to look at what is the kind of writing that people do today? And what, you know, and it, and maybe blogging would be a good idea about, you know, a blog on a topic or something. And the more you do these more fun projects, it prepares the brain for the harder, longer projects. So I don't know how you convince people other than uh, tell them to watch this video. <laughs> we will be doing that for sure. Uh, when we send it out, please feel free to forward it to as many educators and other parents as, as you'd like. We will be getting it out as widely as we can. There's, it's interesting. There's a lot of research. So what I just saw when I was looking up is either Animoto or Glogster, one of the, these uh, links that I've given you. Um, there was a whole bunch of research that they published that people tried this in their classroom and teachers like to see the evidence. And there were like 10 studies, all the different ways that they were using. And I, I, I wish I remembered which one. It was either Animoto, I suspect, or probably Animoto, uh, of, of how kids are more engaged, how their writing is better. And so finding evidence like that always helps as well. Definitely. One topic that's come up from a couple of different angles is that, as you mentioned at the start of the presentation, writing is now impacting across all subjects. Yeah. So it's creeping its way into ev everything. But I think there are some natural points where it kind of always has been like writing proofs for math problems. Although we do see this too, like there's just more writing required in math to justify how you came up with your answer. and. Obviously, if you're a kid who loves math, but you have dysgraphia or some other writing challenge, like now we've made math difficult for you because now you have to do all this writing and math, or it might come up in another context, like somebody talks about, you know, bringing it into like lab notebook writing exercises in science. And I, I know so I, I know a child, uh, to each child in our local public schools who was doing honors biology. She can do the work, but she, they were forcing them to do Cornell notes, which can be great. But for this kid was taking 10 hours a week. So she was losing her love for science. So I guess that was the question is how do we start bringing some of 
of these, um, yeah. you know, options into these other subject areas. Right. And I, I think that uh, I've seen a lot of kids, especially engineers and kids who are more visual, their notes are visual and they can explain them and they are amazing notes. I saw somebody, t uh, one kid's note on, on some theory. And if you allow a lab, you know, if you can get it down any way you want to get it down, there's no reason to say it has to be in words. And if you have a different way to express it, mathematicians talk to each other in mathematical symbols. And they go, you could see movie after movie, how they're writing on the board and they're t pointing these things out. I would like a child to be able, you know, if they have to write their proof, if they're writing a, a math problem on the board with another child and they explain how they did the steps, why do they have to put it in verbal writing? There's no reason. I would say to the teacher, the, it's very important to understand why you're assigning what you're assigning. So I want to make sure that the child understands how they got the answer. And, but that, so aren't there other ways to explain how you got the answer? You didn't say to me, I want to know if the child can put, explain himself in writing. Because if, if that's really what you want to know, that it has to be in writing, you, there's no justification for that. Sometimes things have to be in writing and then there is justification. But if writing is to be used to see if the child understands a math problem, there's many other ways to understand that math problem. And it behooves all of us to say to each other and to teachers, what is your objective? Is your objective that my child learns how to write um, a, a story, a narrative, a descriptive paragraph, or is it today's objective that you want to know if they understand uh, population dynamics and in, in biology? And so if it's to understand the concepts in the unit on population dynamics, what are other ways that that child can tell you? If it's that I need to see if you can know how to punctuate a conversation, well then, fine. But Victor Borga even did it in a song. <laughs> so be clear on your objectives. And if writing is the objective, because you want the child to have a writing skill, but if writing's being used to, to show understanding, then there should be alternatives. You know, and I, I think what happened in the case with this family I know is that ultimately the parents talked to the teacher. The child was not ready to, to self-advocate on this topic. She's been self-advocating on a lot of other topics. Um, so the parents talked to the teacher and the teacher was so responsive and said no parent had ever come and talked about the challenge before. And they, that she knew that in the other classes they had stopped using this, this note-taking system. So I think sometimes two parents are, are afraid to have a good conversation with, with teachers. And sometimes the teachers never heard the feedback. And that's not always true. Of course, that's not always true, but I do think it's a valuable thing for people to know is it's, we can sometimes be afraid to feel like we're gonna ruffle someone's feathers, but there's a way to talk about it with a teacher that is productive for everyone. Yeah, I, I think that if, um there are shorter pieces of writing. If a child uh, is in a class and, and one of the things that it might be on a 504 plan or writing, it's you know just not reduce the amount of writing that that child needs to have during any semester is a good strategy. So that don't sign off on the plan unless you have some control over how much writing. And a plan that was used in a school in, in Prince George's County, Maryland, that the, they waited this child's work differently. He got much more points for projects than he did for the writing assignments. So it, it favored his strength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess another one I just thought I'd mention, see, you know, I, I was in a presentation about uh, universal design for learning and there was a college level class where the teacher had each person share their notes once during the semester. And everyone was a little nervous about doing it, but the, what it showed everyone was just different ways, how different people do notes in different ways. And it gave people new ideas about how they might do their notes. And they 
learned a lot of fun ways to take notes, whether it was sketch noting or uh, whatever it was. And I thought that was a, a super interesting idea too. And then no one feels locked into one style. And a lot of our kids do better by recording. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's that pen, that scribe pen, that where they take notes and if they don't get the note down, the pen is recording. And so if you wanna know what the teacher said, you might write just one word. And when they, the pen then will play back what the teacher said at that word. So mm -hmm. they, it's like note taking and then you have that backup. It yeah. just kind of gives you like a bookmark to the part of the lecture the teacher was giving. So it's 827 and I wanna honor your time and everyone else's and I think we have time for one more question. And then um, if people wanna stay on with those of us from real, we can stick around for a little bit. Susan, if you need to run, that's okay. Um, so I think Yael or Abby has one more question. I can ask you, um, someone mentioned this and you uh, brought it up as well um, about 504 and IEP accommodations that you've seen people ask for related to writing. Yes. Uh, what else do you recommend other than reducing the amount of writing? Are there others you've seen? Uh, well, I, I think that I would make sure that on an IEP or 504 plan, I, I would say I would separate um, when we're developing writing skills, this is what I would like. And when the child is being asked to explain, understand something in a content area, they are to be given a choice. But when it's but then if they're learn they need to write whatever they're writing, then we want to make sure that uh, perhaps it's the length can be reduced, or they instead of producing ten pieces of writing, that they could take one piece of writing and perfect it over time, so it's a beautiful piece when they're finished. Well, every kid would be lucky if you were their teacher. I'm lucky that you are, are my teacher. <laughs> so thank you for, for teaching and for being here with us tonight. I know a lot of you are here because you thought there was gonna be a magic way to get your kid to write. <laughs> you know, and it's about motivation. It's about getting them to love telling you what they know and, if, and, and communicating, think communication. And think of all the ways you communicate of, you know, even if there was a family newsletter, electronic newsletter, a magazine, and they were the editor and it went around the whole family. Those little articles are easier, you know, and they could be setting it up. And, you know, there's so many ways that we can use it that could be excited about it. They would be more willing to do the harder work. Good luck. <laughs> Well, I feel like we all need to like take ourselves off of mute and clap and thank you so much. And Thank you so much. The chat has had just comment after comment about how useful this was and how much people plan to send this out to all their teachers and their schools. So, And I am going to stop the recording now. Okay.